Okay, let's uh, kick it off. And I have to tell you what a pleasure it is for me to be here tonight. Uh, when Father Jack asked me to do this, uh, my first thought was, are you sure you want a dirt archaeologist given the keynote for your brand new clean archive? <laughs> and I, I hope the answer to that after I finish tonight will still be yes. But I have to tell you what a thrill it is for me to join you tonight and to get to share Move it up. Check to see that it's on. Yeah. Okay, we still good? Green light on the console. Your green light? The packet. Is there a green light on the packet? On the radio. Portion Green light. Okay. Let's see. There is no light. Let's see. It's on the top where the two bars are sticking out. The two wires are sick. Press that button. There we there go. There we go. Okay. Well, now we got the green light and the thumbs, thumbs up. up. Oh. Start over. Oh. I'm going to start over. And boy, I bet you can hear me now. I can really hear me now. All right, what I was just doing is, is thanking uh, Father Jack and every, everybody else here uh, for the opportunity to uh, let me share a few thoughts of my own uh, about archives and about particularly Franciscan archives. Here's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I know this is a bit of a reach and I want you to stretch it with me. What I want to do is make a case that the archive here, we all have something in mind about what that means. And I think whatever that is, let's stretch it a little bit. What I want to tell you as a practicing archaeologist is I think the archaeological record out there is also itself an archive. And I think archaeological sites and even archaeological artifacts are the documents in that archive. I've been working for four decades on Franciscan archaeological sites. And what I've learned is to understand the meaning in those places it requires multiple voices, and many of those voices and perspectives are sitting here in this room. Now, I come to you, although I work at a museum in New York, as a misplaced Westerner. Uh, I was raised in California, and I spent much of my career as an archaeologist working on what's called the Spanish borderlands. Now, this is a concept that takes us from San Francisco, California, to St. Augustine, Florida. And what the, the idea here is there is something about this patch of the United States that has a unique history in the United States. There's something very special about this part of the country that was settled by Europeans using Franciscan missions as part of their strategy. To understand the concept, you have to go back to Herbert Bolton, 100 years ago, a professor at the University of California, who basically was taking exception to the way Hispanic and Franciscan history was being taught in this country. Instead of it being a matter of the black legend about God and glory and gold, what he argued instead, the essential Hispanic strategy for the United States involved three key institutions, the Presidio, the Pueblo, and the Franciscan Mission. And it was a very different strategy than what you saw with the British coming in, one of manifest destiny. The idea here is to keep the native people on the landscape, not push them into reservations because we want the land to use for ourselves. So it's that concept that really holds, are we okay with this? Okay. It's that concept that really holds together the borderlands. Now as a confession, I was raised in California as a kid who was really interested in Indians and really interested in archaeology. And my mother had a sense of a bent for history, and she took me to all 21 of the Franciscan California missions while I was still in high school. Now that was an important experience for me. Not only did I become the rest of my life professionally involved, in trying to understand what those missions had to teach us. But it also, in California, is something that we don't have in most of the rest of the country. Literally, as a high school kid, 
I could walk up and put my hands on history. I could touch each one of those 21 California missions in a way that brought the Franciscan and the native people who built those missions, they brought it alive for me. So as I ended up at the biggest natural history museum in the world in New York City, I was given an opportunity to study pretty much any place in the world I wanted to and pretty much anything I wanted to. So I decided, I think I'd like to study Franciscan missions. Well, as fate would have it, my first assignment in Franciscan missions as a professional archaeologist took me to St. Augustine, Florida. It is, the, despite what you hear about Santa Fe, it is the oldest city. It was established in 1565, oldest European city. It's also the oldest tourist trap in the country. And it's something, in fact, they're even kind of proud of. When I got to St. Augustine, I was surprised to learn of the deep Franciscan history there. I was a kid who thought he knew a lot about Spanish missions, and the more I realized I was going to start working down there, the more I realized what I didn't know. It turns out the chain of Franciscan missions that spread across Spanish Florida, which includes much of the state of Georgia, older, bigger, involved more friars and more Native Americans than anywhere else in this country. So how come nobody ever heard of it? Well, there are a couple of answers to that. One of them is what I just told you. In California, you can put your hands on history 21 different times. Those Franciscan missions are still very much alive. And as we all know, uh, Junipero Serra is now Saint Serra as of last year, because the majority of Californians still think he was the most important person who ever lived in California. That doesn't exist in Spanish Florida. Instead, there was an interest. Where's our archeology? span Where are our buildings down there? In the 1930s, the daughters of the American Revolution, of all people, said, we found the Spanish missions of Florida. There are these tabby buildings. Now, tabby is a construction technique you don't see here, but it's, it's how you build concrete buildings when you don't have any rocks. What you do instead is you burn oyster shell and you pour it into a form and you put the shells in instead of rocks. You can build buildings like this. So the conventional wisdom for a couple of decades in Florida, in Georgia, these are the Franciscan missions that have been long lost. And I have to tell you, it took an archaeologist, James A. Ford, who was one of my predecessors at the American Museum, to come in and do the archaeology of the Taddy buildings. And what he found is the daughters of the American Revolution, with all due respect, were absolutely wrong. These are Civil War antebellum buildings. They were built by enslaved Africans, and they, the archaeology has exactly nothing to do with Franciscan missions. So in one archaeological dig, then, the entire suite of Franciscan missions in Spanish Florida disappeared. There was no place to put your hand on 16th or 17th century Franciscan history in the Deep South. And as a result, that history disappeared. St. Augustine, when it showed up in the history books at all, was a place that was kind of a second-rate Spanish colony of 200. And the missions if St. Augustine was an outpost, the Spanish missions were outposts of outposts, and they were so irrelevant, they just disappeared. They couldn't even leave buildings that survived. I was lucky enough to begin working on a place called St. Catherine's Island, and many in this room know that place because they've been there. It's one of the sea islands, and as an archaeologist, I showed up and the first question I asked, where is Mission Santa Catalina de Wally? It was built here in the 1570s. It was abandoned in the 1680s. Where's the site? And all I got was an answer from the people living on this island, and there weren't very many of those. 
you're about 300 years too late. The last person ever to see Santa Catalina de Wally was in 1687. No one has seen it since. It was probably the most important of the Franciscan missions, and it has just flat out disappeared. Well, I didn't know much about the Deep South. I didn't know much about alligators and jiggers, because we don't do those things in California, <laughs> or palmettos, or the rest of it. But I am an archaeologist, and one thing I do know is how to find things. That's what we do. So we use the combination of random sampling and political probability theory to literally random sample a place that's 14 miles long and 4 miles wide. We literally walked one out of every five square feet on St. Catharines. We found something like 150 archaeological sites. If that's a 20% sample, that tells us there are about 700 sites there. It's loaded with archaeology. And it has a place called Mission Santa Catalina de Wally. It took us five years to find it. I used to say it took us 25 years to excavate it, but the truth is we're still excavating it. We're still working there today. It's a different kind of Franciscan archive. This, when you look at what I have on the screen, that is not your notion of what a Franciscan mission ought to look like. But to somebody who's trained to read the documents, this is an extraordinary find. It's an entire Spanish mission under about 14 inches of hurricane debris, and it's perfectly intact. It's never been plowed. And what you're looking at is the perfect manifestation of a Franciscan mission translated into terms that an archaeologist understands. So if you look down at the bottom left, that's a church, and it's built around a central square and it has the public buildings on the other side, and it has a wall around it, and it's divided into streets. What you're looking at is the same town plan that created Santa Fe. Downtown, church is right there, and the rest of it. It was just covered up. This is the church at Mission Santa Catalina de Wall. The altar is at the upper left, the Campo Santo is to the bottom right. When we found this, I called the Bishop Lassard for the Diocese of Savannah and said, Sir, I think I found something that belongs to you. And he says, What's that? And I said, Well, it's the oldest church in Georgia. Maybe it's the oldest church in North America. And it's Franciscan. And the Bishop said, Why? What a coincidence. Why, just last week, we declared something called, called the cause of the Georgia martyrs for five Franciscans who were killed in 1597, two of them in that very church. Now, this is the same week. I've learned, having spent more time with Franciscans, the concept of a coincidence is not something that sells very well <laughs> in the Franciscan world. So, this is, I had driven over this site a hundred times. You couldn't see it, and yet it's perfectly intact there. Now, if I'm going to convince you that archaeologists deal with archives, like you have archives that you're building here, I understand that translation is involved in both cases. Many of the documents that are going to appear in conventional archives need to be translated. Same is true for archaeology. This is the translation of what I just showed you. This is the reconstruction of an almost contemporary, a slightly later, Franciscan church in Tallahassee, Florida. This is a lot of what the one on St. Catharines looked like. It's very much the same size, the same structure, oldest churches in North America. So, we started digging, and we dug. And not surprisingly, the church itself, and it's roughly the size of this room, was also a cemetery. This is also a translation. We found 432 people buried beneath the floor. 
of that church. I asked Bishop Lessard if he had a problem with our excavating the cemetery, and he says, no, the souls have long departed, and what we need to know is what the Franciscan churches were like at the time. I also work with Native American communities. Uh, I helped found the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. This is a story that Native people have interest in as well. But most Indians that I know are squeamish when I go to show human remains, so I don't do it anymore. I don't show pictures of dead Indians in lectures like this. So what I'm showing you is a translation. What these are are representatives of 10%, 10% of the people who were buried inside Mission Santa Catalina given Franciscan burials. What you're seeing are Halloween cardboard cutouts that we fashioned to look exactly like the burials that we encountered. We think we can do this in a respectful way, but we also think what we're finding is extremely important. Now, archaeology is fun. It's really fun to find stuff. And we have a lot of people that we've been able to get involved in the archaeological process. But there's a saying in archaeology it's not what you find, it's what you find out. What we found, and this is just a little bit, a smattering of the photographs, we found many artifacts relating to the Franciscan order. There were more Franciscan 16th and 17th century religious objects in this one site than from the rest of the country put together. In this, remember poor little St. Augustine, the poorest outpost of the outpost? That wasn't true at all. The documents were absolutely incorrect, and it took the archaeology to straighten that out. So, we have a bunch of artifacts. How do we know what they mean? Well, archaeology is a team sport. It takes lots of people to do this. Dedicated people with strong backs and eventually bad knees and the rest. My crew is so tired of hearing me tell them, archaeology is a team sport. There's no I in team and there's no I in archaeology. We're all in this together. We need good, talented, motivated people. So at one point we were running a little short of funds and we put out a call to an outfit called Earthwatch. And it's a chance for people who want to get involved in some aspect of science. Help us pay the bills a little bit and you can come along on a scientific excavation or expedition and we'll teach you what to do. One of our Earthwatch volunteers was a marathon runner who was in great shape and an excellent digger. And his name is Father Conrad Harkins. At the time, he was head of Franciscan studies at St. Bonaventure University. The Franciscan order, I guess, paid a thousand dollars for his fee to come and have him join our dig. That was a surprise to us when Father Conrad arrived and we, I asked him, what made you want to come and join all these other archaeology students? And he said there are two important reasons. One is the Franciscan order is considering, to do, considering doing some excavations at Assisi and I've been asked to be involved. He said, I thought it would be a good idea if I knew something about archaeology before I did that. That makes sense to me. And the other thing he said, I want to be in the place where two of my brothers, Michael and Antonio, were martyred in 1597. Well, it was pretty unorthodox at the time, but I decided, you know, let's go for it. Father Conrad said the first Mass at Mission Santa Catalina in 300 years. He not only said the Mass, but he was involved in finding the artifacts and telling the stories behind that. He was not only involved then in reading about Franciscan history, he was involved in producing it. One of the things we did while Conrad was there is excavate the friary. There are actually two friaries superimposed here. And in the process of building the archive, we kept asking a number of questions because I didn't understand 
a lot of the archaeology that we're seeing. Now, this Margaret Mead is not supposed to appear later. We had a little problem with the slideshow. Uh, I'll get to her. I had a lot of questions. What is this weird thing in the middle of this building? Father Conrad said, it's obvious. It's a foot font that friars used to take care, the barefoot friars, to heal their feet. And why? I didn't understand why the rooms were so small. And he said, they're called cells. And they're the ways friars lived at that point in isolation. Makes perfect sense. I didn't understand the white object up here in the corner. There's a well. Why a well? There's plenty of fresh water to be had around Santa Catalina. And about this point, and I had a, why are there grave goods when the Franciscans prohibit that kind of thing? I had all sorts of questions. Finally, Father Conrad just sort of shook his head. And he said, you're an anthropologist, right? Right. He said, you worked with Margaret Mead, the most famous anthropologist of the 20th century, right? Yes, I worked with Dr. Mead for six years. What you should do is what Margaret Mead would do, is study Franciscans like any other primitive religion. <laughs> and I said, okay, and how would I do that? And he said, what would Margaret Mead do? And I said, she'd go live with the people she was studying. And he said, then that's what you need to do. So he extended an invitation to me to go to St. Bonaventure. He was the head of Franciscan Institute at the time. And I love this slide. I just pulled this out. This is the advertisement for the Franciscan Institute summer programs today. But it's exactly what Conrad told me 30 years ago. Open your mind to a new Franciscan way of thinking. And so I did that. And I spent several trips to St. Bonaventure to work with Father Conrad and the other friars who were there to understand something of the archaeology. I knew the archaeology, but I didn't know the Franciscan background. They knew the Franciscan part. They didn't know about the archaeology. Now, this was great because not only was the Franciscan Institute at St. Bonaventure operating full-scale and they were publishing Franciscan History, the journal. But it was also the place where a number of friars in the Northeast retired. So as I was giving a lecture, sort of like this, I was talking to a hundred friars in robes. Now, if you think that's not a little intimidating, <laughs> maybe Margaret Mead would have been comfortable doing that. But it got my attention. So what I did was go through and just explain, we have more Franciscan material than any place else in the country. Look at this. We've got a Pieta scene. It's made of gold and silver. It's probably a chalice cover. There hasn't been another one of these found anywhere else in the world. It was in the church at Santa Catalina. And look at those rings. Archaeologists are accustomed to seeing finger rings in mission context all the time. The Jesuit rings showed up by the barrel load, but they're these cheap little imitations of metal. If you look closely at these, these are solid silver with the sacred heart on them. No one's seen anything like this before. So I was running through the list, uh, kind of, oh boy, do we have some great stuff to show you guys. And at one point, I showed a slide, and he said, wait a minute, Go back to that last slide. And I said, which one? He said, the one with the medallions on it. And he said, what do you see there? And I said, well, uh, I see St. Francis receiving the stigmata, the five wounds. It's a common, we have a lot of these. That many of them come directly from the Vatican. And he says, no, no, I don't mean that. He says, what's it around the edge? I said, it's the Franciscan cord. We see that a number of times. And he says, right, right. But how many knots are there? <coughs> there are four knots. And I said, huh? And he said, there are four knots. And as we, we don't have to look at too many Franciscans <laughs> to know that they don't have four knots, they have three knots to celebrate to, to show the three vows that they've taken for poverty and obedience and chastity.
Finding a fourth knot suggests a fourth vowel in the Franciscan order 400 years ago, 300 years ago. Well, this caused quite a stir in the Franciscan community, and I was there for a while. And Brother Cyprian, at the time, was in charge of the library, drove him nuts. And what he did was spend days in the library, and I remember him coming to dinner one night, and he says, I've got it. What I did was track down the hometown of all those friars who served at Mission Santa Catalina, and they all came from one little place up in the mountains of Spain called Badajoz. They took a fourth vow to defend the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, well before it became uh, 19th century dogma in the Franciscan order. Maybe that's the reason. Now recently, with St. Sarah's uh, canonization, there's been a great deal of work on, on Sarah, and what we found, or what scholars of, of the subject found, Sarah took a fourth vow as well. He's from Mallorca, and 200 years later, he took exactly the same vow to protect the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. But in his case, it didn't turn into a fourth knot. I don't pretend to have the answer to this. I do think it's fascinating as we look at different Spanish missions in different places about the meanings of what it is to be a Franciscan in these specific spots. So what I'm saying here is the process of doing archaeology was enriched immeasurably by the interaction with the Franciscan order. Franciscan history became quite a topic for the first time in the Deep South because of the archaeology and because of the interaction of the Franciscan order. What you see here is President Carter presenting the artifacts from Santa Catalina de Wally. We donated everything that we found to the Fernbank Museum of Natural History, which now has a huge Franciscan artifact collection of its own. Carter's reaction was a little bit different. He looked at all this stuff and thought it was great, and he said, finally, we don't have to get our history from Yankees anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works, you know. But it, it, many of these materials are on display in Atlanta, and there's an entirely different view of the deep Franciscan history in that part of the world. So things were going pretty well. This was shortly after the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus in 1492-1992. And one of my jobs was to do something for the archaeological community to observe 500 years after Columbus. Well, we ended up doing nine seminars and published three books at the Smithsonian. In that top book, the blue one, is featured prominently an essay by Father Conrad Harkins. Conrad came to our national meetings, he became part of the archaeological dialogue, and his is one of the most cited papers here because he was expressing a Franciscan perspective on what happened as a result of the Columbian encounter. Also because of Conrad's involvement, not just with us, uh, but with, with Bishop Lessard and the others, he became eventually a vice postulator in the cause of Georgia martyrs. And what he did was pull together the case, based largely on archaeology, that was presented to the Vatican. So we thought he was a pretty good member of our archaeo team, even though it didn't have an eye in it. The other thing that I have to say is kind of cool. In 1992, Father Conrad had me come back to St. Bonaventure, and he presented me with the Franciscan medal. What's important about that to me is it showed archaeology is an archive that Franciscans can use and address. It's a very moving thing for me. Um, I put that, I framed the medal, and I thought, you know, this is a pretty special event too. So for the first time, I took it out of the case <laughs> 
And I know I'm not the only one in the room who has received one of these. But I have to tell you how proud I am as an archaeologist that to me, what we're doing has importance to people besides archaeologists. Now, to finish the Santa Catalina story, we still had an issue. We had opened this massive archaeological site. We'd excavated 432 people who were buried there, all Native American, no friars. Uh, and the question was what to do. Bishop Lassard and I huddled uh, with the Franciscan order there. What should we do? And we all kind of agreed we ought to rebury these people where they were initially buried, where they'd received their Franciscan burial. But Bishop Lessard said, you know, we Catholics are really great with ritual, but I don't quite know what we ought to do here. And as it turned out, I was just coming back from a trip and stopped at Pearl Harbor. My dad had been at Pearl Harbor. He survived it. And as I went on the boat out to the Arizona, I learned that the USS Arizona, with 900 people still in it, is still a commissioned ship in the United States Navy. Not because that battleship is going to go fight any battles, but because of its symbolic importance to what happened. And Bishop Lessard and I talked about that. We said, what if this site were reconsecrated as a Franciscan church? And we agreed to do that. This was covered in National Geographic magazine. So the site, the archaeological site, is now listed as an active church in the Savannah Diocese. Today, the church looks like this. It has a living palm tree. It's not open to the public. But periodically, we do, we certainly make exceptions to the Franciscan order and to the Savannah Diocese to come. This is Bishop Hartmeyer, who visited the site a couple of years ago when he took over. He's the first Franciscan to be a bishop of the Savannah Diocese. He not only came and looked at the site, he looked and read the archive. He's looking at artifacts that came out of this church, and he's trying to understand, we're talking about it, how do you know the stories that you tell about Franciscans in this place are true? And so we showed him the kind of analyses that we do with our students. We also, two years ago, were fortunate enough to host the Academy of American Franciscan board meeting, just like today. But two and several, as you see, people who attended here came to St. Catharines again to take advantage of perhaps the oldest church in this country, but the Franciscan presence there and what we're learning They said a Mass. There have been seven Masses said on this site right now, and there'll be more. But in the process of spending time together, at least I made, to me, a remarkable discovery. I mentioned that I was involved with the National Museum of the American Indian. One thing we were trying to do on the Mall in the Smithsonian was to tell the story, we're still here. Native American people are still in this country and they can tell their own stories. You don't need a scientist like me to tell them. That was a kind of a revolution at the time. What we were doing was involving the native voice, and it was considered to be controversial. As we worked more on the museum on the mall, the obvious question came up, which voice? There are 700 registered, federally recognized tribes in North America do we want the Navajos telling the stories about the Hopis? California Indians telling Iroquois stories? What does that mean, the native voice? What I realized during conversations after the board meeting a couple of years ago on the island, we have a similar issue here, really. Some of the things that we talked about with the board members, the answers came out differently than what Father Conrad had to say. And I was a little concerned about that at first. And then as I learned more from my Franciscan friends, I realized what was going on. I was told, for example, I hope you don't mind my repeating this, that if you meet a Jesuit, you'll learn about the Jesuit order. When you meet a Franciscan, 
you'll learn about one Franciscan. <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty good life. And then as the conversation went on, to the same <coughs> dilemmas that I posed to Father Conrad, and I was asked, have you figured out the answers to your problems yet? And I was working on it, but I didn't think I had all the answers yet. And it was explained to me that you have to think of Franciscans as amiable anarchists. <laughs> amiable anarchists. And I said, what does that mean? It means that salvation is the goal. And sometimes Franciscans have to take different routes to get there. But the goal remains the same. And understanding that has given us a different way of looking at Franciscan archaeology, understanding that we're probably not going to be rewarded for getting the one hard and fast rule, but rather looking across the borderlands at decisions that different Franciscans and native people were making under the circumstances. Now, let me bring this a little closer to home. Let's talk about the other oldest city, <laughs> Santa Fe. Now, for the record, although it was promoted in the early days, largely by archaeologists, that this was the earliest European city in the country, the truth is Santa Fe was formed 42 years later than St. Augustine. So if you're going to brag about Santa Fe, what you need to say today, it's the oldest capital city in the country. Okay, fair enough. There are plenty of Spanish missions around the Santa Fe, New Mexico landscape. Many were destroyed in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Many others have been rebuilt. The truth is, we know almost nothing about the archaeology of these missions. For all the work, for architectural reasons and clearing and the rest, there have only really been two digs that went on here in the Southwest because you already have, you still have friars, you still have native communities, and people thought we understood what we needed to know about missions. So one of those sites, there's a problem here because most of what is still written about Spanish missions in the Southwest flows out of the grand narrative that comes to us from, remember Herbert Bolton 100 years ago? And the local documents have also been very often interpreted the same way. The grand narrative is pretty simple. You have a dominant culture moving in Presidio Pueblo mission and laying on top of a submissive culture that changes entirely. Either they change or once in a while they rebel, as you can see in this priest killer Kachina from Second Mesa at Hopi. And the idea is that what we should just look at this, the reality of it, it was inevitable that Hispanic culture was going to come in and erase native culture. And what we're finding is the archaeology doesn't show that at all. A literal reading of the documents may support it, but we think there's a great deal that's left to learn. So let me give you an example of why we need to get that other voice in there, a little material reality. The Kiva is probably the most sacred space that exists in Pueblo society. It's, par it's possible today to do an archaeology of Kivas, even though they're sacred spaces. This can be done in a respectful way. What do I mean? Well, if we go back to one of the big digs, I said there were two. One was done uh, by the Museum of the American Indian out at Zuni at Hawaiiku, and the other was done by Harvard University at Hopi at Awatavi. This is the reconstruction of the church at Awatavi. And what they found with the stratigraphy, three altars of the second church were built on top of a kiva. And the interpretation universally accepted in the 40s, this is to show superposition. It's to show the dominant culture is deliberately stamping out the submissive culture. They're doing it because they can. And for a long time, this is the way we've been viewing missions in this part of the world. 
There's another way of looking at it. At Pecos Pueblo, there's a great deal of archaeology done there about 25 years ago, maybe a little longer. And one thing they found was a kiva that was built inside the convento out of Pecos. You can go inside it today. What's that mean? Oh, that's reverse superposition. After the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, what happened was the native groups came in and they built a kiva right in the middle of the Franciscan space because they could. That's been the conventional wisdom. The problem is, as we do the archaeology of these places, that Pueblo, that kiva, was not built after 1680. It was built in 1630 under the supervision of Franciscans who were still living there. Hmm, what, what about the dominance and the grand narrative? Doesn't work in this case. Doesn't work in another case either. Uh, my colleague Jake Ivey with the Park Service has been doing a lot of work on kivas in sites throughout the Southwest. And what he found, if you look at a bow, one of the Salinas missions to the south here, right smack in the middle of the convento is a kiva that was built in 1632 under the supervision of Franciscans. And what this means is you've got, even though the kiva might be the sign of the devil, in some cases, friars were negotiating this space differently. A kiva is an instructional space. We want the two cultures to get along. What does it hurt if we build a kiva and use it and make it part of our church? Amiable anarchy? I don't know. <laughs> this is why we started a dig about 15 years ago now. We've had two big digs on missions in the Southwest, 1920s, 1940s. What we thought we'd want to do, wouldn't it be cool, it'd likely get a barn and put on a show, wouldn't it be cool if we go out, bring the American Museum and invite all the Southwestern archaeologists to come and join us? And so we did. We started working at San Marcos in uh, about uh, 98, and we set up a fellowship program, an internship program, where we had uh, Hispanic kids, Native American kids, to come and work with us as interns. Work on, fight out the revolt of 1680 every day if you want to. But they didn't. They enjoyed what they were doing. What the, my museum had literally worked at San Marcos 100 years ago. Nels Nelson came out, did a lot of work San Marcos, uh, which is on the turquoise trail at Cerrillos, uh, about 15 miles south of Santa Fe. Uh, the biggest Pueblo in the Southwest, the sixth, uh, 3,000 rooms. Nels Nelson thought, this is great archaeology, spent a lot of time doing it, couldn't care less about the mission. Typical of the day. We care about the mission. So we came out and spent several archaeological field seasons mapping it in great detail and comparing what we could find in the ground with what we find in the written archives. Some of it went like we expected. We found some of the paintings inside the convento that had been ruined uh, in the revolt of 1680. But what we found is when we opened up the altar of the church, it wasn't destroyed in a revolt. It was being rebuilt when it was abandoned. What this means is there's at least one reoccupation of just one place in Marcos. And we can't tell whether it was a Franciscan community that came back or a native community that had become Catholic. But whatever it was, it was after the Pueblo revolt. And curiously, on top of that altar, we found broken pieces of the mission bell. Now, where in the conventional history does that fit in? Well, we all know, and uh, Diego Romero's uh, very cool painting of this, about the Pueblo Revolt breaking out in 1680. There are two metonyms involved here. A metonym is something, like if I talk about, you know, like they do in Hollywood, everybody knows what I mean. Hollywood is a cue 
for a whole set of feelings. There are two metonyms here operating in this painting. One is the expression to live under the bell. You see it in the documents, you read it in the Indian oral history, you hear it today. People living in a mission-like setting are living under the bell. That soundscape runs their lives. It's when to wake up, it's when to go to sleep. Uh, it, uh, Bishop Lassard was telling me the same thing. He hated that bell in the morning because it was the voice of God and he knew he had to obey. So to have a mission bell ringing means we all agree, Franciscan, Native Americans, others, this is how we're going to live our lives. Under the bell is a metonym for a good Franciscan Christian life. But what happened in the Pueblo Revolt? When they came down from Taos, the rebels chanted two things, kill the friars and break the bells. And that's what they're doing here, is breaking the bell. So on the one hand, you've got the bell as a symbol of acceptance of a certain way of life. And breaking those bells is exactly the opposite. We're not happy with that way of life. We want to do something else. So here's a chance to translate complex behavior into a material record that we can actually see as archaeologists. This is a pot from Mission Santa Catalina de Wally. And if my graphics are working right, what I would have shown you is the pot sitting like this, and we talk about how we thought it was something about for dedicating food or something. But we understand it meant to be looked at like this. It's actually a bell. It's just made out of ceramics. And what it is, is a Wally Indian symbol about living under the bell. So as we start asking these questions, we start looking at different ways of understanding it. What we're doing in our new research is putting the bell back in rebellion. We're literally looking at the bells, the mission bells, across the borderlands. I've got a sample of about four to five hundred mission bell fragments now from archaeological sites across the borderlands. And what we're doing is we can literally do a forensic analysis to see what happened to that bell. Because they had lives. If you think about it, what kind of questions can you ask of a piece of bell like that? Where did it come from? Who made it? Did it have a certain use life? Did it have future expectations? Did it live in life stages? Is it part of one culture? Does that use change with age? Do artifacts retire? Do they have an afterlife? Can they be resurrected? The key here is two words. Archaeologists talk about provenience. That means where we find something. We measure it in, in three dimensions and do all that. The art historian has always talked about provenance, which is the life history of a particular painting. And what we're learning as archaeologists, we need to understand both. We need to understand where the thing was found, but we also need to interrogate that life history to see where it came from. And I'll give you an example of those four to five hundred bell fragments we have. One of the coolest is this one. It's in the collection at the American Museum. It was discovered by Nels Nelson a hundred years ago. Many of you probably know where the site of San Cristobal is. It's out in the Galisteo, just over the hill from Pecos Pueblo. What was its provenience? It was found inside a secret kiva that was built in that building right next to the church. It was hidden away in a kiva after the Pueblo Revolt. What were the bell fragments doing on the altar at San Marcos? They were put there deliberately. So what we're starting to try to do is understand by looking at the life histories of these artifacts, we're in a position to start understanding something that doesn't show up in the written archives. What about the pro-Christian factions in the Pueblo Revolt? History doesn't talk about that, but the archaeology does. And so the more we look at this, we understand 
there's a great deal that we can find out by looking at specific artifacts, documents in the archive. Now, to here I switch over to California because that's our best evidence. Uh, Fran Franciscan historian May Maynard Geiger has spent a lot of time talking about mission bells. And what Father Geiger said, they start out their life. This is the provenance part, their life history. How did they start life? In a commercial way. They're made by a bell manufacturer. And at some point, they go from being secular to sacred. In California, all of the mission bells were baptized. They were given Christian names. He's got several cases from the 1820s where they had godparents who took care of them. They have lives and they have deaths. When they're broken, the pieces are picked up. The convento I showed you at St. Catherine's, that had 200 bell fragments in it. After the friars were martyred there, when the, the natives said, we're, we're Christians and we need a church, and a friar. When that came back, they gathered up the bell fragments, we think probably to be recast into new bells. They could have been resurrected, but the archaeology got in the way. So what I'm saying is, there are things we can do with this, but we're also, it's an incomplete story. It's incomplete because it's California. There were no rebellions in California. I spent, not last summer, summer before, my wife and I looked at every archaeological collection in California from the missions. There's not one bell fragment in any of those, and yet we've got hundreds from the southwest and from the southeast where we know rebellions occurred. So it's a pretty neat little story, but I'm not so sure, come back to the amiable anarchy part, is that the way bells were treated in the Southwest, or is that a different tradition? Is that a different feeling? There must be something in the archives, the written archives, of the Southwest that talks about that. We're doing the same thing, trying to look in the Southeast. So in a sense, what we're trying to do is deconstruct. We have a great Franciscan truth here. I'm just not quite sure what to do with it. So there we are. Why am I arguing? that archaeology is important as a Franciscan archival enterprise. One is, I think it gives us a way to address the biases in the written record. We all know the truism the people who win the wars write the textbooks. As a textbook writer, I agree with that completely. But what about those other stories that don't get written down? Archaeology gives us a great way to involve descendant communities, Franciscan communities, Native American, others. Archaeology lets us learn stories, histories, that we didn't know before. It gives us a way, what about the four knots? What about the bells? Are those just easy stories that we as archaeologists come up with, or they can really be defended against other archives? And finally, it gives us a way like Father Conrad coming to join our dig to translate history into the active voice. Thank you.